Okay, thanks Tim. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world today. Um, my name is Bruno Zago, as Tim said, and I'm a sustainability manager working for HP. Um, I'd like to thank Tim for giving us the opportunity to speak on the Green IT Week. Um, and I'm really looking forward to listening to all the other speakers and everybody else that's presenting. So what am I going to talk about today? I'm going to give you a very quick introduction to HP, who we are, what we do, um, talk about environmental sustainability, some of the impacts to the planet, some of the things that HP is doing to reduce both its own impact and the impacts of other people. And I'd like to talk a little bit about supply chain as well. So, before we start, I just wanted to um, give you a quote here. Um, oh, bear with me a moment. No, I'll just move the screen out of the way. Um, Unilever, Paul Polman, the CEO of Unilever, said a couple of years ago now, how to grow sustainably is the biggest challenge facing companies everywhere. And it's something that we at HP agree with. Um, I know that Paul reading his bio and what he's done here, as a company, Unilever used to report quarterly. And one of the things that Paul has done is actually change that to annual reporting for um, the shareholders and stakeholders and um, obviously the financial institutions. And one of the reasons he did that was he said that what he really wanted to do was put Unilever onto a sustainable growth path and you couldn't do that by having to report quarterly earnings every quarter obviously but by planning ahead one two three five years in advance you can start to grow sustainably and since they introduced their um, sustainable living plan the share price has lived, uh, risen so I just wanted to give you Unilever as an example and clearly it's outside of our IT sector Okay, so the next slide should be coming up now, and it's global resources under stress. Um, when we think about what's going to happen in the future, we know that there's going to be a considerable increase in the demand for energy. We're looking at 53% by 2035. Um, one of the examples close to home, I'm based just outside London in the United Kingdom, is that during the construction of the Olympic Stadium, um, in the years preceding 2012, there was a huge demand for um, electricity in the east of London for the actual, um, not manufacturing, but for the building of the stadium and all the environs around it, and of course for the period that the games were on. And it was very, very difficult for any companies in London to actually increase the amount of energy required into their data centers, their buildings, etc., because of the demand of the Olympics. Um, with energy, we also see a projected increase in CO2 emissions. You can see there it's 43%. It's normally a given uh, when you burn more fossil fuels uh, in creating uh, energy, you're also creating CO2 emissions at the same time. There are various figures about the number of Earths required to support the population. I've seen numbers from um, WWF, other um, non-governmental organizations, but the one we've chosen here is 2.3 Earths will be needed to support the growing population. We reached 7 billion people um, in 2011 and we're projected to reach 9 billion, and that's quite a low estimate by 2050. So what, what does this mean for us in the IT industry and, and us as a planet as well? Well, it means increasing energy costs. The CFO of most companies will be looking at how much their energy costs them and how that relates in the end to CO2 emissions. We know there are going to be more carbon regulations coming along, and when we talk about increased risk, it's not just about regulation. We've seen like the extreme weather events that have been happening that climate change is causing. 97% of um, climatologists all agree that the climatic events we're seeing are man-made now. Resource scarcities. 
as these nine billion people on the planet want a middle class lifestyle much as we have in the west the demand for resources is going to increase and when i say resources we can talk about food water but also things like owning a mobile phone owning technology all of these things are going to make a big difference to us going forward in the future so who is hp as it says here on the slide, we are the world's largest provider of information technology infrastructure, software, services and solutions to individuals and organizations of all sizes. And um, if you don't know HP, we are a manufacturer of servers, storage, networking equipment, PCs, tablets, notebooks. Um, we're also the sixth largest software provider in the world and we provide outsourcing services and break-fix services across the globe. Uh, last year, I think HP turned over about $127 billion. Of that $127 billion, about $60 billion was directly related to our supply chain. So that is the products that we manufacture that we then sell on to our customers and clients. So we are a Fortune 10 company in the US. Fortune 28 globally, and we operate in over 170 countries. We've got about 350,000 employees that work directly for HP. Um, if you start to include things like the supply chain, our distributors, our retailers, etc., you know, we're looking at a million plus people. We have 177,000 partners worldwide, and you will have seen us be number one or number two in most markets from servers, PCs, and printing. So what do we do? I've, I've just put this slide up here to show you some of the things we do. I'm not going to read through the slide there. But uh, one of the interesting facts I heard recently was that for every seven smartphones that is put on the market or that is out there at the moment, um, you need a server. So I thought that was an amazing statistic. When you think every seven smartphones you have to, we have to provide, or the um, telecoms provider has to buy an additional server. Okay, so how do we approach um, sustainable growth? We look at it in three ways. One is our portfolio. That's basically what I've just talked about in terms of our products, our services and solutions, what we do for our customers as such. It's then about our supply chain, and it's working with our supply chain to make sure that we actually manufacture in a responsible manner, and that we promote sustainability throughout the whole supply chain. So that is our contract manufacturers, the people that supply them the raw materials, all the way through to the extraction of those things um, before they even get turned into a material that we can use. And then it's about our own operational performance. It's what we do with our own buildings and our own premises and how we're doing things to reduce our impact on the environment. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through the slides. So how to do more with less. Um, as I said earlier, HP's approach is looking at the whole holistic piece that HP does. So it's the data center where there's a lot of discussion now about cloud computing and, of course, imaging and printing and what we can do to reduce the impact of imaging and printing, printing documents. We can talk about things like um, electronic scanning, PDFing things, double-sided printing. Um, we'll also touch on things like um, HP's thin client and what we can do within the desktop and of course what we can do within the data center to actually uh, reduce our impact as much as possible. So the energy efficient data center. So really, if you look at a data center, there's, there's a lot of things happen, happening in a data center. You've got servers that are running, you've got storage that is spinning, um, you've got the networking equipment, and of course all of that needs to be called at the same time. So um, I'm sure many of you have heard of um, the equation, the PUE, the power usage effectiveness. And this is where we talk about the amount of energy that comes into a data center and, the, and then splitting that energy into the useful work it's doing 
i.e. what it's doing with the servers and the amount of work that it's doing in terms of cooling those servers. So when you look at those figures, a traditional data center, and I'm talking, you know, one of the data centers, if you imagine a lot of them are several years old, some up to 20 years old, you'd be looking at a PUE of maybe three. Um, that means that for every unit of energy that goes into that data center to actually drive the servers, you've got and three units that are actually driving the air conditioning and the cooling for that infrastructure. Um, a good data center now is you're probably looking at about 1.7 to um, 2. Um, HP has a data center up in Wynyard, which is in the northeast of England, that actually uses fresh air cooling um, so that we don't have the air conditioning on. Uh, I believe it only comes on for about two days a year. And this is because you've obviously got fresh air coming off the North Sea, but on top of that, um, the temperature is a lot cooler, and we set the data center temperature to be higher. So I, if I remember rightly, we talked about something like going back 100 years worth of temperature records to look at what the temperature was up in the Northeast, and it only actually goes above 22 degrees for about two days per annum. So hence why it's a good position for a fresh air cooling data center. You'll also see on here um, HP Thermal Logic. This is about a sea of sensors within the servers and within the server racks themselves. You know, again, traditionally one of the issues was that you would just pump as much fresh air as you could into the data center to cool those servers and then um, the devices within the racks. Now, we're actually looking at using thermal logic, which is a sea of sensors that can actually direct the fresh air cooling um, onto the specific areas you need to. So, i.e., this set of blade servers over here is getting warmer than this set here, so you can direct more air to these servers here to cool them. We also have variable speed fans and um, power supplies that ramp up and down. So basically, if there's no demand, the power supplies will actually switch themselves off. As demand increases, the power supplies will ramp up to provide the amount of energy that's required. Um, the performance optimized data center, the pod here, you'll see on the next slide here. It, it's basically up to 4,000 servers in what we would call it, you know, a truck container. Um, you can see it uses 95% less energy than a traditional bricks and mortar facility. The EcoPod itself actually uses fresh air cooling, and you can see it draws air in from the vents here, um, so you don't need to attach it to any traditional um, ventilation system, so that the cooling provided is actually free at the end of the day. Um, you can see here it costs up to 75% less to build. Clearly, that is a lot to do with the traditional data center where you would have a bricks and mortar infrastructure. And the pods can be placed anywhere. We're finding that many of our clients, where they've run out of space within their data center, are actually putting pods outside in the car park, etc., to increase their own processing capacity. OK, when we talk about the computing environment, so here we're actually talking about the desktop more than anything else. I'm sure, again, many of you will have come across thin client solutions uh, versus fat client solutions. When we talk about things like the cloud, I think personally from a lot of the information I've seen and a lot of the data I've seen, um, the jury's still out about the environmental benefits of the cloud. Clearly, there are a lot of other benefits in terms of data security, et cetera, and the ability to, or the availability of data. But when we're just looking at the green and sustainable angle, I think when you look at thin clients and fat clients, they're fairly, you know, they're fairly similar in terms of their environmental impact. Um, it's just where is that impact? With a thin client, clearly the impact is all within the data center, and with a fat client, it's actually on your desktop. Um, but there are good reasons why you would go to thin client. Uh, one of the examples that HP has is we have a thin client that actually works um, via the Ethernet, so you don't need to plug it into a traditional main socket. 
it draws about 13 watts, I think, which um, your, the Ethernet cabling is quite capable of delivering. Um, energy efficient PCs. Um, HP has a wide range of Energy Star PCs. Um, we also have EPEAT. Um, I don't know how many of you have come across EPEAT, which is uh, basically it takes Energy Star to another level. Um, it doesn't just include energy, it includes things like what are the materials inside the PC, what are the recycling facilities available at the end of uh, life of the PC. And you can see down here HP Asset Recovery Services and Recycling Solutions. Um, asset Recovery is where we will come in and um, if there's some value with your equipment, then we will pay for that equipment. We will then refurbish it and resell it and we can do that on your behalf or on our behalf. And of course there's the final end of life recycling solution. Um, in terms of the desktops themselves, again, there are many, many different ways that you can be more energy efficient. Traditionally, a lot of people left their um, laptops or their PCs on overnight, mainly because they were worried about coming in in the morning and it takes 10 minutes to boot up, or they were worried about patches being installed, etc. But there's lots and lots of different software. HP uses something called Land Desk Energy Conservation, uh, and this is really a tool that allows you uh, to set priorities onto a PC so you can turn them off over the weekend, for example. You can make sure they're turned off overnight. If you have to add a patch to them, it will automatically fire the PC up. It will take things off like screen savers. I don't know how many of you out there are aware that if you have a screen saver on your PC, it's actually making the PC use more energy than if you didn't have the screen saver on there. So lots of things you can do in terms of your own desktop environment. So Project Moonshot, this is something that HP announced um, recently. It's basically um, servers, but using uh, smartphone technology. And you can see here, we're talking about 2,800 servers in a single rack. Um, they use about 89% less energy, take up 94% less space. Um, and reduce costs by up to 63%. The important thing for me here is the 89% less energy. So in a traditional um, data center, you would be cutting your energy costs by up to 90% and saving space as well. Um, traditionally, um, these servers, they, they've been around now for about, I think we announced them in April this year, so two months. Um, HP.com, which is obviously our website, has about 3 million visitors a day, and we're actually running HP.com on 1260 watt, or it would be, be the equivalent of 1260 watt um, light bulbs. Um, I did see something recently that made me smile, because that's what was in our press release, and um, somebody said, why didn't they use the example of, you know, um, 120 six watt um, energy saving light bulbs. So you can equate it to that, but we're talking about 720 watts as such, which I think is fantastic. So in terms of the printing environment, you'll know that HP um, manufactures printers and provides something called a managed print service. You can see some tools here that we use to manage those printers. Um, basically, we talk about a balanced deployment here. Again, traditionally, you had many people who had a printer sitting by their desk. It would only print single-sided, um, and the move is to go to, as I was saying, this balanced deployment, which is really about having the right number of printers for the number of people in a particular workspace. It's making sure that these printers um, are all set to double-sided printing. Um, all the printers that HP manufactures that have the capability of printing double-sided are actually set to double-sided printing when they leave the factory. Um, double-sided printing, again, lots of people think it can halve um, the amount of paper you use, but really you're probably looking at about a 30% reduction in paper usage. The main reason for that is not all jobs have an even number of pages. Um, and also, not all jobs will um, 
be suited to double-sided printing, i.e. if you wanted to put some posters up in the workplace or whatever, you would only print single-sided. Um, the HP WebJet Admin and EcoSmart there are basically tools that allow you to manage your printer fleet. So for example, if you have a multifunction printer and you don't use the fax option on there, you can switch it off. Why keep the printer enabled in a sleep mode? Because you might be expecting a fax overnight or over a weekend or whatever. If you're not using that function, then the tool allows you to switch it off. You can also set up all sorts of um, policies and rules around who can print uh, color, who can, um, everything should be double-sided, etc. So as an example here, um, this printer, we have something called auto on, auto off technology. Traditionally, with a multifunction printer, um, when it was in sleep mode, they were still using maybe up to 15, 30 watts, just basically being in standby or sleep mode. With auto on, auto off technology, we've taken that down to less than 5 watts in a lot of cases but we still allow the printer to warm up very rapidly so that when you get there, the print is actually available for you. Um, again, it's about thinking about ways of doing things differently. So rather than, let's say, copying something and giving it to someone, you can scan it in, send them um, the copy by email. Again, what happens to your cartridges at end of life? How many people just put the cartridge into the waste paper bin or into the general rubbish? HP offers solutions that allow you to return the cartridges back to HP where we will recycle them or we actually re, um, reuse the plastic. We process the cartridges um, and we reuse the plastic to make new cartridges. And I'll talk about that a little bit more later on. So I've mentioned the WebJet Admin and the EcoSmart Console. Um, basically, it can give you information on paper usage, who's been printing. Um, it allows you to monitor what people have been doing. It allows you to basically manage your whole um, printing environment, both from a cost perspective and an environmental perspective. So normally I would ask people the question here about um, what does HP ship every day? Uh, and the reason that I put this slide here is to give you some idea of the scale of HP. So if we look at PCs and tablets, we actually manufacture and ship about 170,000 systems a day. And that's, that's a huge amount of equipment. Um, like I say, the reason that I put this on here is to show you the impact that we have in terms of the amount of plastics we use, um, the amount of manufacturing we do. We obviously have uh, logistics and transport of getting these products across the globe. Then there's the amount of energy that they use during their use phase. And of course, what happens to them at end of life, i.e. recycling. In terms of printers, we're looking at about 140,000 printers every day. I don't know how many of you have come across um, HP Snapfish. It's basically a um, photo printing online solution. And we have about 30,000 orders a day. So an order can be anything from one photo up to producing a nice photo book for someone or 100 photos that they may have ordered. And finally, we're talking about 3,500 servers every day. So why is it important to us? Um, we, we like to look at things from a full life cycle perspective, and HP has something called DFE, which is Designed for the Environment. It was actually founded back in 1992, and HP has, uh, it's around about 200 product stewards whose responsibility it is, is to look at the environmental impact of HP's products at the design phase. So the idea here is the design phase is the most important piece because the way you design it will actually affect how you put it together, i.e. the manufacturing, how easy it is to take apart at end of life and separate all the different pieces, i.e. asset recovery and recycling. It also um, affects how you transport the product, 
How easy is it to package? What packaging should we use? How much energy does it use in the use phase? So for us, the design piece is critical. Um, we then move on to the manufacturing and supply chain. Um, basically, you will know that, or many of you will be aware, that a lot of the manufacturing takes place in the Far East. I think about 75% of HP's manufacturing is done um, in the Far East, China, Taiwan, Japan, etc. And, and of course, most of our sales are in uh, Europe, Middle East, and the Americas, and of course, sort of the developing nations now when we start to look at India, China, um, Latin America, and we have to move those products around the globe. So the way that we transport them, the way that we package them is really, really important to make sure that we reduce our impact on the environment as much as possible. During use phase, again, most of this is related to energy in the use phase. So everything we can do to reduce the amount of energy is really, really important. We also talk about um, materials as well. So during the use phase, it is things like you know, making sure that we print double-sided, making sure that at the end of um, a cartridge's life, it's returned to HP for recycling. Um, in terms of end-of-life recycling, I mentioned earlier that the easier you make something to put together, also the easier it is to take apart. So when we start to look at um, the recycling option, which should be the very last option that we use, redeployment, reuse should be um, something that we think about before actual physical end of life, which is dismantling and recycling. Um, if we make things easy to take apart, it means the recyclers can take them apart very, very easily. Um, and that means we can separate materials much uh, better, and it means the quality of the recycler we get will be far more improved. So in terms of um, our manufacturing, you, you will have seen a lot in the press recently around uh, manufacturing in China. Most recently, the blaze in the slaughterhouse. Um, HP has done a lot to improve conditions and everything within its supply chain. One of the things that it did recently was it started to limit the amount and type of student labor that was allowed to work in its factories. Um, one of the things we said was that basically if you're a student, then if you come and work in one of our factories, it has to complement what you are studying. So if you're going to be a geographer, there is no point coming to a HP plant and working on a production line, making circuit boards or whatever. Um, we've also looked at things like reducing the number of hours that students work. So in terms of temporary workers and students, um, we're below the um, legal minimum that they are allowed to work. I think I've got that right. It, it, basically, what I'm trying to say is that in HP factories, students will not work the maximum that they are required to by Chinese law. Um, another thing that we've done is many of the factories are actually on the East Coast. And so migrant workers have moved from the center of China out to the East Coast. This means that they can't get home more than maybe once a year. Um, so one of the things that HP has done, working with its contract manufacturers, is to move the factories more into um, the central China. And it's called a Go West program. And this allows people to be able to get home at weekends and things like that now. Um, I think in the PDF that you've got, you'll see that there's a video which was um, produced by the New York Times, and, and it features HP and a couple of other manufacturers. Um, and if you have the opportunity, it would be good to um, watch that video. Okay, I don't know how many of you have come across conflict minerals before, all this term. Um, Basically, conflict minerals are uh, they're, they're minerals that are used to manufacture capacitors in most ca um, cases. And it's something called coal tan or tantalum. And basically, um, much of it comes from the Democratic Republic of Congo in Africa. 
and you can see a picture of a mine here, um, but some of the mines are controlled by um, militia, and um, the, the money that comes from these mines actually goes to funding arms, um, and basically one of the things that HP has done is set up something called a conflict-free smelter program, which you can see here. And what we're doing is making sure that you know the um, conflict minerals that are available in the Democratic Republic of Congo do not end up in HP products. So for us, it's about setting up a conflict-free smelter program. You can see down here in the lower picture um, that what we're doing, these are tags, so we can actually trace where um, the minerals have come from. So we can go to our smelter and trace all the way back to which mine this stuff came from. You can see that traditionally these mines, it's, they're all worked by hand. Basically, um, the soil and the minerals are, are passed up by hand through the mine. We then tag them. They then go to our conflict-free smelters. And that's the most important piece really here is around traceability. And again, for us, I think it's great that we've been uh, ranked first by Greenpeace um, in the conflict mineral program. So reuse and recycling. I mentioned earlier that you know, recycling is the final option uh, for a product at the end of its life. You know, if you return a product to HP, the first thing we would do is look at, can we reuse it? Can we refurbish it? Can we remarket it? Or can we sell it to somebody else as a second user system or a second user device? We also do donation programs, but at the end of its useful life, we will have to recycle that product. And basically, that means taking it apart and then using the recycler in uh, either new products to HP or in using it in other things. You can see that we provide recycling in 67 countries worldwide. Um, one, one of the pieces here is we worked with an organization and, uh, called Kamara, and we've actually set up a recycling program uh, in uh, Kenya. And it's called East African Compliant Recycling. Um, Many of you, again, will have seen uh, the various stories on TV or in the press where you've got children burning um, cables to remove the plastic from them so that they can sell the copper onwards. One of, one of the things that we wanted to try and do is give people, one, some jobs, and two, to make sure that doesn't happen. Give custom, our customers and also our competitors' customers the option of recycling their equipment. Um, this was opened in 2011. You can see we're opening um, another place in uh, Nairobi. Uh, I think it's opening later this year. And our objective is to capture 20% of the e-waste that ends up coming from um, customers in Kenya. OK, um, HP released literally on, I think it was about May the 15th, um, its whole carbon footprint. I believe we're amongst one of the first in the IT industry to actually um, reveal our whole carbon footprint. And you can see here that 4% of our impact actually comes from our own operations. That, that's quite small. So when we say our own operations, it's our own offices, buildings, factories, um, traveling and employee commuting. The next biggest piece is 36%, which is what we've worked out um, our supply chain produces. So this basically is a full life cycle analysis of HP, our products, our use phase, and what happens at end of life as well. And we're talking about 36% from our supply chain. Again, this is really about material extraction, so I gave the example of the minerals earlier, all the way through to manufacturing, let's say the capacitors, then putting those into a product, then the finished product being transported to you as a um, business or consumer. But the biggest impact comes from our products during its use phase. 
And this really is, this is down to the amount of energy that the product is using. And you'll see that we've calculated it to be, you know, just under 80 million tons of CO2 equivalent. And like I say, um, I do truly believe that HP is either the first or one of the first in the IT industry to um, reduce, um, reduce uh, reveal this information. Why have we done this? Well, one of the things that we say is you can't manage what you can't measure. So by measuring this, it actually starts us on our journey to actually put targets in place to actually reduce our carbon footprint going forward. We've done a lot within our operations. We have a goal to reduce um, our operations by 20% by 2020. Um, our products, our imaging and printing products are 40% more efficient today than they were um, compared to 2005. And our uh, PCs and servers are something like more than 50% efficient compared to 2005. So in terms of our operations, I, I mentioned Winyard, which is our data center up in the northeast of England. As you can see here, um, in terms of energy saving, it saves us up to $4 million a year. Um, HP originally had something like 300 plus data centers. They were consolidated down to about 85 data centers a few years ago. And recently, we've gone down to six data centers. This is what manages HP's operations. So this isn't the trade data centers that we operate on behalf of our customers or run for our customers. These are the six data centers that basically run the HP infrastructure. Um, and there's six because in reality there's actually three mirrored pairs. And this has reduced costs by about 60%. And I think the um, figure associated with that is something like a billion dollars. In terms of emissions, you can see um, what we've done there in terms of our original goal. Uh, we met that um, two years early, and as I've mentioned earlier, we've now set a new goal to reduce by 20% by 2020. Um, we use um, renewable energy in a lot of places. In the UK and Ireland, we've got 100% renewable energy. Um, the total for HP across the, across the globe is about 13%. Of course, there are other things that we're doing. Um, a prime example down here is that we've reduced the amount of um, inbox documentation by about 5.7 billion pages. Some of you who've um, bought a PC or whatever um, over the last few years or more than a couple of years ago, you may remember that you'd get the end user license agreement and you'd get all the warranty information and that would be in like 28 different languages. Um, one of the reasons that we, we've changed that now is that every single product we manufacture, we now know where that is going. So for example, if we're manufacturing a product for France, the documentation you get will only be in French. So that's one of the examples where we've reduced um, the in-the-box in materials. You'll also find that things like startup guides, um, they are now uh, actually pre-installed on the machine. So you'll only get like maybe a small piece of A4 that tells you how to plug it in, how to turn it on, and then when you turn the machine on, it tells you, um, or it has all the information on there of how you set it up and everything else. Okay, I just wanted to give a, a brief view or glimpse into what HP is doing uh, for the future. And basically, what, one of the things that HP is looking at is something called photonics. And the idea of photonics is many of you will know that you, know, you transmit um, information over copper wire. We're looking at using fiber optics, and you may even have a fiber optic cable that's coming into your home. Um, I'm sure you've got some uh, in your businesses. But when we talk about photonics here, it's really about replacing the copper and the interconnections within the computer equipment itself. So it's i.e. connecting things via light or optical rather than copper. Um, again, 
a lot of the heat that you get in a traditional data center or from the PC that's sitting on your desk or your tablet comes from the movement of electrons over a copper wire. So if we can take that away, we can actually um, provide the same scalability, the same um, productivity for about one-tenth of the amount of energy um, that is being used traditionally. Uh, Memorista technology, again, this is a new technology. It's um, using sort of uh, nanotechnology and nanomaterials. And as you can see here, again, it's 10 times faster than um, traditional semiconductors and uses 10 times less power. So again, it's about reducing the amount of energy and also reducing the amount of um, resources and materials that are required to produce this. And finally, HP has been running what we call a net zero energy data center. Um, it's a pilot that's running in our Palo Alto labs in the US. Um, basically, the way that it works is it's powered by renewable energy. In this case, it's solar. And the idea here is that you know when you start to look at um, workload, if we look at this, oh, let me just move that. Um, if we look at where we are here, traditionally all this workload is being done outside of what let's call daylight hours. If we say this is midday here, which is where you get most of the sun, so you get most of the solar energy or renewable energy, it's about moving this workload into a period of time where it's being provided for or catered for by the renewable energy. And any additional energy like here is fed back into the grid. The whole goal of the net zero energy data center is not just about being net zero in terms of the energy that the servers are using, but it's also about looking at, we, we use this word um, embedded carbon. It's also about looking at the embedded carbon within those servers and the embedded carbon in the infrastructure or the building. So when we say net zero, the goal is to actually get to net zero. Um, this is my final slide. Basically, there are a few links on here which take you to the HP website. Um, I've mentioned quite a few of the things on here already. A um, couple of things that I just wanted to point out was the HP Carbon uh, Footprint Calculator. There's an online calculator that allows you to assess the impact of your printing and your PC products through the full life cycle of the product. Um, the HP Sustainable IT Purchasing Guidance White Paper. Again, this is to help procurement people look at um, how they can include sustainability within their RFPs and RFIs that they send out. Um, and I think, Tim, that's me done, if there are any questions. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Bruno, for that uh, for his presentation. It was fantastic and very uh, thoughtful and uh, very thought-provoking as well. So that's correct. If, uh, we will now commence the Q&A portion of the, our live speaker session today. So if you do have any questions that you would like to submit for Bruno uh, to address, uh, please do so now in the GoToWebinar control panel in the questions box. Uh, feel free to ask questions about his presentation, his work with HB, or perhaps his experience has been green IT or sustainability at large. Uh, Bruno will be able to address each question in turn, but please do remember if you would like to speak with Bruno or a representative of the Foundation for IT Sustainability, please feel free to email info at bits.org at any time following this session. I'd be more than happy to assist your query following the conclusion of today's session. So um, without further ado, we'll kick off the Q&A session now. So as I mentioned, please do submit your questions if you have some. Okay, Bruno, first question we have is, there's some great information uh, in your presentation about HP's operations and, and also what you're doing for customers, but can you tell us a little bit more about uh, employees? Yeah, so um, HP... Over, over the last few years, we've had several um, chief executives, as some people may well be aware of. Um, but our CEO now, a lady called Meg Whitman, um, she's very much behind sustainability. And um, we base, 
recently, uh, I think it was last Tuesday, um, we had an all employee briefing and in Meg's address to all the employees, there was um, quite a few mentions of sustainability. So for us, it shows that sustainability is on the chief exec's mind. Um, we have some programs running in HP. One of them is called like employee resource groups, and we have something called the HP Sustainability Network, which is um, HP employees in various locations throughout the world who are part of a sustainability network. I think. Uh, at the last count, there are about 3,000 employees involved in the network, and basically they put on things like, you know, um, demonstrations during Earth Day. They will work with suppliers and providers to put on events to show people how they can reduce energy in the home, etc. And we also have something called the Eco Advocate Program, which is really a series of webinars that are advertised mainly to the salespeople to help them in their work with customers. And we've had about one and a half thousand people attend those webinars recently. Fantastic. Thanks, Bruno. The next question we have is, what are, what are some of the greatest barriers you face at HP uh, when implementing internal green initiatives? Is there a lot of support from uh, management as well as general employees? Uh, yeah, uh, in terms of um, what we look at with, with our own employees, there's, a, as I mentioned earlier, we have the sustainability network. Um, I, I think we have to separate uh, the environmental and the sustainability piece from the financial piece as well, because wherever we can, we, we will look at things like energy saving, which obviously have a positive benefit in terms of employee morale, um, in, and in terms of cost as well. Um, there are lots of initiatives that I've seen, specifically in our own offices. You, know, you won't, for example, see um, any uh, waste bins at people's desks. What you have to do is go to a recycling point. So basically, we've reduced the amount, uh, well, we've taken away everybody's waste basket. But not only does that mean that we've improved our recycling rate, for example, but it also means we've lowered the cost for taking away general waste and things like that. So we have um, lots of initiatives that come through from employees as well, and that's not just for um, our own sort of buildings and operations, but it's also about how we can do things with our products and improve our products as well. Thanks, Bruno. The next question we have is, there's a lot of discussion about the circular economy and using recycled materials. What is HP doing in this area? Okay, um, so the circular economy is really about reusing resources. Uh, and for us, the, I think I mentioned earlier, one of the important things is that before you actually recycle something, you should look at what other options are available to you. So can you redeploy it in your business? Can you reuse it somewhere else? If we're talking in the consumer space, can you hand it down to your children or whatever? But there will come a point where you actually need to physically recycle the thing at end of life. And it's about using those materials again when you've actually recycled the product. So I think, you know, most of HP's products are more than 90% recyclable um, where the facilities exist. And, and one of the examples I would give there is when you return your printer cartridges to HP, basically they're, they're taken apart by a process, the plastic is um, shredded, um, what we then use is that plastic and post-consumer waste, mainly in the form of plastic bottles, we actually mix those recyclates together and um, if, if you talk to the guy that designed the process, he'd, he'd call it, we add in some pixie dust, which basically brings the plastic back up to its original properties. And then we can reuse that to make new cartridge bodies. And um, we've produced over one billion cartridges now using recycled content. Um, but one, one of the greater, even more so than that, we've actually started to use um, recycle plastics from our own products back into making some new products. 
So the HP, um, the new HP OfficeJet um, X Pro actually has, uh, I think it's up to 5% recycled content in there, which actually comes from plastics returned to HP. Great, thank you, Bruno. I actually have a user submitted question, which is, what's, what's coming up in the next three to five years around green IT for HP? Um, I think what, what's coming up, you're going to see um, lots, of, lots of change, lots of things happening in terms of the way that we do things. I think we'll see more in terms of um, mobile working um, and people basically moving away from a fixed infrastructure to a mobile in infrastructure. Um, in terms of green IT, I mentioned Project Moonshot there, which is the servers. Uh, you're going to see a technology shift as we go forward. The amount of data that's out there is, is huge. And I think it's what happens to that data. What, what can we use that data for? Um, one of the things that HP is looking at is something called Sense, which is this uh, central nervous system for the Earth. And, and it's basically um, billions of nanoscale sensors that we can put out there and, and they can be used for things like it. Let, let's take an example of um, farming you know at the moment when when there's a lack of rain or whatever a farmer will water his field the water will go everywhere there'll probably be a lot of runoff same with when he has to put fertilizer on there you know it, it's basically averaged across his whole field if you have a network of sensors out there that basically says, well, I don't need any irrigation over here, I don't need any fertilizer over here, you can actually then start to target the hotspots that you need to treat. And this can be done with um, all sorts of things. You can put sensors on bridges that rather than you know, starting at one end, as they say um, in the UK, painting the fourth road bridge, you know, they start at one end, then over X number of years they reach the other end and then start again. Um, you can actually use the sensors to target where should you be painting. And we, we believe that you know, we can um, increase the, the life expectancy of those sorts of things by at least 50% by using those sorts of technologies. So I think we will see technology play a bigger and bigger part in um, reducing environmental impact. Fantastic. Thanks, Brian. The next question is, can you give us some examples of solutions that help reduce an organization's carbon footprint? Um, so, some of the, from an IT perspective, I, I've mentioned several of the examples there uh, earlier in terms of making sure that, you know, you manage your energy within your organization. So there, there are certain tools that HP has, which are things like Energy and Sustainability Manager. We have a carbon emissions service, which basically can look at your organization and tell you where you're using energy from an IT perspective. Um, there are also solutions around how you can reduce the amount of energy required in your data center. Um, there are solutions that help you with printing. So uh, an example that I would use in terms of printing is if you look at, I can never remember the figures, but something like 30% of printed material, and, and that includes everything from books, newspapers, leaflets that get delivered to your door, etc. But something like 30% of all printed material it is basically recycled before it's actually used, either because it's been printed and um, it's now out of date or people don't look at it or you know, you've done a print run of several thousand books because using traditional analog printing processes it's actually cheaper to print a thousand copies than it is to print ten copies. So you can look at solutions that allow you to do on-demand printing for example and, and an example that I often use there is if you if you go into a bank today you often find there's like a leaflet on the side that says you know great interest rate of 
two and a half percent in these days of uh, financial austerity. But basically, those interest rates are changing practically on a daily basis. So once you've printed that leaflet up and uh, you, let's say you print it somewhere abroad in Europe, it's then transported to the UK, it's then sent to each of your branches. By the time it gets there, it's probably only valid for two or three days. Then what happens is that you need to change it, so all of that goes off to be recycled and go through the process again. If you could print those leaflets in each individual branch or maybe in a central branch in um, a specific location, what you can do is print on demand and just print a hundred of them for your local branch. Once those hundred have been taken, you can print another 50 or another hundred. So basically you're reducing the amount of printed waste that's out there. So it's those sort of solutions that IT can help with. Looking at transport and facilities and things like that. Um, again, with printing, HP has something called smart web printing, which is um, basically downloadable. If you use one of the internet, I'm sorry, internet search tools and just put in HP smart web, and it's a tool that you download, and basically it allows you um, to click and select various pieces on a web page. So I'm sure many of you have sat there before, you've looked at a web page, I don't know, for somewhere that you might be going, and you say print, and you get the information you want, then you get about another three or four pages that just have an URL on them or loads of advertising. Um, Smart Web will actually select what it thinks you need, and it's usually very good at doing that. But you can change that as well and just click pieces and say, okay, I want the picture of where I'm going, I want the address, and I want the phone number, and just print what you need rather than printing you know, the four or five continuous pages that you get. I hope that's a couple of examples. Great. Thanks, Bruno. Uh, you mentioned design for the environment and HP's carbon footprint. How does HP go about measuring the impact of their products? product carbon footprinting or life cycle analysis? So as I mentioned earlier, you know, HP has um, done a lot of work in looking at its operations, its supply chain, and the use phase of its products. So when we, when we look at carbon footprinting, as I said earlier, it's about being able to measure and manage at the same time. So we can set ourselves goals around that. Um, I think now we've conducted around about 50 life cycle analyses um, on our printing products. Um, and basically, it's to look at the impact or the embedded carbon of the whole product. So basically looking at um, material, raw, material raw extraction all the way through to manufacturing, including transport, then the use phase, and then how much energy is actually required, or even in some cases return by recycling um, the equipment at end of life. Um, life cycle analysis is important for us to understand all those different phases and where the biggest impact of the product is. So for some products, if you take a, if you take you know your um, notebook on your desk. The biggest impact is probably going to come from the manufacturing, um, the raw materials, and the transport. Basically, because if you're looking at, at you know, a, a very energy efficient notebook, um, it's using maybe 15, 16 watts a day, um, an hour, sorry, which is very, very low. So the, bigger, the biggest impact will come from the manufacturing and the supply chain side. You take something like a server, where the server and its associated storage is running 24 by 7, probably for five years non-stop. The biggest impact is in its use phase. So by understanding those things, we know where to concentrate our efforts. So in the case of the notebook, the effort is concentrated in the supply chain. In the case of the server, the effort is concentrated in actually making it more energy efficient. Um, there are problems with life cycle analysis um, because there are, there are various methodologies out there. 
and different organisations and different industries are all doing this in different ways. And there are things about setting up the boundaries, really. So how far back do you measure? And you know, in the example, if you remember the slide um, about HP's carbon footprint, um, you would have seen raw material extraction. As an example, do you go back to the raw material extraction, or do you then include actually the you know the device, the JCB or whatever it is that actually took the material out of the ground and the amount of embedded carbon that was in that. So there are different ways of doing things. Um, HP is also working with industry, and um, we've come up with something called PIA, which is Product Attribute to Impact Algorithm. I know that's a bit of a mouthful, but basically it's a tool that allows you to, or allows us, to actually measure the impact of our PC products and monitors. So we're talking desktop PCs, notebooks, monitors, etc. Um, well, because a lot of those have, um, you know, I'm not going to say standard components, but you know, most of them will have either an Intel or an AMD chip in there. They'll have a disk drive. They'll have memory. They'll have a display. Um, they'll have some plastics, and metals. Um, the idea is that you as an organization, because we're seeing quite a few organizations out there asking us about um, the impact of the product from an embedded carbon perspective, basically what you can do is then compare um, two of the same types of products. So if you take a HP notebook that is, let's say, a 15-inch screen, um, a one terabyte disk drive, and a 32 gig memory, um, uh, it will have the same impact in terms from its manufacturing and raw materials as one from our competitor, for example, if they're using the same or similar components. Um, the idea behind this is not so that you can compare HP to its competitors. The idea behind this is that you can analyze the impact of your for those of you that don't know, there's scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions. Scope one is basically the, the fuel or energy that you use directly as an organization or as a person. Scope two is mainly in the form of the energy that's provided to you, so i.e. the electricity that comes into your buildings. And scope three is really the energy of everything around you that you have purchased or acquired. So the, a lot of companies, like I say now, are looking at the impacts of their scope three. So they're trying to see, okay, within my IT infrastructure, what is the impact of the 5,000 desktops that I've just purchased or whatever? And Pyre allows you to do this. Great. Thanks, Renee. Are there any other questions? Yeah, please, if you do have any questions, please do, please do submit them in the GoToWebinar control panel. You'll see a questions or chat box, so please do drop them in there if you do. Uh, another question I have for you, Bruno, while waiting, is um, HP is well known for printing. What are you doing to help people cut down on their printing needs? So, I mean, printing is important to HP's business. Um, it, but at the end of the day, so is being a, glo a good global citizen. Um, for us, th there are lots of things that we're doing to help reduce the impact of printing. Everything from sort of making our printers as energy efficient as possible. I think HP has the, the largest number of Energy Star um, qualified printers. Um, it's things like uh, managed print solutions. So if you're, look, if you're in a large organization, it's about having um, HP come in and provide a printing service to you. Again, it's allowing you to manage what you measure. Um, some of the examples that I see, you know, when, when people are looking at moving from you know, uh, basically printers on everybody's desk to uh, a, a balanced deployment, as we call it, for me, uh, what I say to people is, before you do that, as an example, you know, just save all the paper that you've got that is being left by the printer and um, maybe put it in a big pile by reception to make people see the impact of that um, of when their employees are coming to work. 
Um, so it's about reducing the impact from an energy perspective and a resource perspective. Um, I don't know how many of you have come across the term pool printing. And again, many of HP's devices come with a, a pool print feature, which can be enabled through the uh, HP WebJet admin software or tool, or you can do it yourself. Um, if you're running sort of uh, Microsoft or Windows on your PC, you can select the printer and basically you can um, put in there, I think it's under job storage actually, and you just say, you know, you need a pin to print. This basically means, in terms of pull printing, that the printer will not print a document until you actually physically go up to the printer. And you can set it up to either put a pin in, some of them you can use your ID badge or a fingerprint scan. And the idea here is that how many times do people sit at their desk, print something out, then print something else out, then, oh, it's end of day, they go home, and the job's just sat on the printer, and basically the cleaners come along, they take the paper out, they put it in the recycling bin, and, you know, you haven't collected your print. Using pull print technology means that you can actually walk, it's not printed till you physically walk up to the printer. Um, other things around that, in terms of looking at... Um, what you can do to reduce your impact it is just simple things I mentioned it earlier you know scan something in and then send um, an email with the scan or the PDF into um, to your colleagues don't you know make 10 printed copies and hand them out it's about using I think the word is sort of electronic document flow you know, rather than sending things around in hard copy, use the tools that are available today to actually move documents around, to store documents. You know, if you scan in, um, I don't know, let's say all your invoices, not only are you sort of like making the material available to everybody and a lot easier, but you're also saving in terms of storage costs, in terms of um, physical space, and financially, because a lot of the time, you know, you send this stuff into a warehouse somewhere and you're paying to keep it there. Great, thanks Bruno. Uh, we haven't received any more questions, so we'll make this one the final question tonight, Bruno. Uh, final question is, what do you think is the most important thing customers should be doing? Oh. <laughs> that's, a, that's a very good question. Um, I, I, I suppose I, I suppose it really is about working top down and bottom up. So I think the most important thing for me is that you make sure that sustainability is on the chief executive's agenda or scorecard, and they and that they're behind um, sustainability for their organisation. Um, and you have to make sure that the employees are also made aware that sustainability is important to the organization. You know, I know that um, for many companies who are employing sort of um, graduates, you know, one of the key things the graduates are looking at before joining a company is, you know, what is their sustainability plan? What, what, what is their corporate social responsibility? Um, I do know that when, when we look at those things, the you know, chief finance officers, chief executives, you know, they're, they're thinking about the, the triple bottom line, really, which is you know, people, planet, and profit. And I would say that you know, if you're looking at sort of the way that they need their goals to be set, it is around, let's say, you know, energy reduction. You can look at energy reduction from two ways. One, it's reducing your costs, which the CFO will like. But two, by reducing your amount of energy that you use, not only are you reducing your costs, but you're also reducing your CO2 emissions. So I think you need to tie it in that way to make it um, more interesting for your CEOs. The other thing is, 
the lots of organizations that I speak to, the if we're talking about IT specifically, many of the data center managers, chief information officers are not responsible for their um, energy budget. They basically run the IT, but facilities are the ones that pay the electricity bill. Um, I think you need to make the IT manager responsible for paying the energy bill and make sure that they see the energy bill. And the whole point there is that, again, if they see it and they're measured on it, they will be um, inclined to reduce the amount of energy that they're using. Um, again, I think um, we looked at the sustainable procurement guide earlier. You know, as an organization, I think you, know, you need to start looking at your request for proposals, look at your suppliers, put questions out there to your suppliers around sustainability. Ask the question. Ask about energy efficiency. Ask about what you're doing in the supply chain. Ask the life cycle question that somebody asked earlier. You know, you need to include these. Um, save energy is, is another easy one. It, it's all about reducing the amount of energy that you use, whether that be by putting um, your PC in a standby, switching it off in the evening, you know, e even simple little things that I know many people don't realize that leaving their phone charger plugged in without the phone um, plugged into it is still using energy. The, the laptop that you've got or maybe the printer you've got, if it's got one of those external power supplies, even when the device is off, the power supply is using some energy. It's not a lot. It's half a watt, maybe one watt. But it is still using energy. So if it's not in use, unplug it, I think, is the easiest thing to say. Um, I mentioned um, printing. I don't think there's much more to say about that. Um, but finally, it, it, for me, it's recycle responsibly. I think at the end of life of the product, you know, one, is it truly end of life? Has it got a second life or a second use? Can you redeploy, reuse, or whatever? But when it does reach the end of its life, don't, don't just throw it in your black bin rubbish, which is going to end up in a landfill somewhere. Take it, if it's home stuff, take it to a civic amenity site where it's separated so it can be recycled. Um, if it's business, um, recycling, make sure you use somebody like HP or a responsible recycler. Um, for me, end of life is, is really important because we, we, we talked about resource scarcity. So for us to get the equipment back to be able to reuse um, the plastics, etc., in our own products, it, it, it's a great story. So please just think about recycling responsibly. I think they, they, they would be the key things for me, Tim, at the end of the day. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Graham. Well, that will end our webinar session for today. So please, uh, thank you to our speaker, Bruno, for certainly for your time and your willingness to share your information and your experiences today. Uh, also, thank you to all who participated in today's live session. We're glad you could join us and we hope the session was helpful for you. Just a reminder for all that are watching that, that a recording of this session will be made available within 24 hours via the Green IT Week virtual conference webinar page. Uh, were there any closing remarks or comments, Bruno? Um, just to say thank you to everyone for um, listening. Thank you for some great questions. And um, if you have uh, any questions or anything, you can see my email on the screen there. Um, for those of you that are reviewing this webcast, if you have any questions, feel free to drop me an email. Fantastic. Well, thanks again, Bruno. I really do appreciate your time today. That will conclude our session for today. So thank you again, and please do enjoy the rest of your day. If you'd like to see a, a, the upcoming schedule of events for the rest of Green IT Week, please do check out the homepage. And remember to subscribe to each live session that you'd like to be a part of. Again, thank you, and please enjoy your day.